Hello, thank you for joining Liberating the Queen, a podcast where we discuss amazing women in history that weren't in my history books. My goal for 2018 is to share what I have learned with all of you the 15th of every month. I am Susie Mosco, and today is September 15th, 2018. This episode is brought to you by Peppermint Bay by Layla. Head over to Etsy and search for Peppermint Bay by Layla for all your bath bomb and lip gloss needs. And as always, joining me here today is the owner and operator of Peppermint Bay by Layla, Layla Mosco. Hello, everyone. I am very happy to be here today. So, Layla, today we are going to talk about a woman from ancient Greece. Now, I know that you were a big fan of Wonder Woman. Do you remember the Wonder Woman origin story? Like where she came from? Greece. Well, she came from the mascara. It was close. <laughs> what? But. <laughs> so, she's from mascara. The mascara. Mascara. Right. Um, well, today we aren't going to talk about the actual Wonder Woman origin. We're going to talk about sofa. Sofa? I thought you sit on a sofa. <laughs> no, she is from antiquity. She came from the island of Lesbos, was a lyric poet whose work was so popular in ancient Greece and beyond that she was honored in statues and praised by figures such as Solon and Plato. Much like the tales of Robin Hood, there are disputes on whether Sapo was a myth or an actual being. We know someone wrote poetry using that name, so as we go through the story, I'll let you be the judge. Okay. <laughs> That sounds good. Now, and yeah, so you were just talking to me about Wonder Woman, and now you're talking about the story. Yes. Okay. Got I'm it? Not. Yeah, got it. Okay. Okay, bye. <laughs> Sapo was, she was an enormous task to take, as not much is known about her. But I feel her passion in her poetry and I feel uh, a lot of emotion when people are writing about her. So clearly, she's very polarizing. Um, so I invite you all to take a journey with me to the island of Lesbos. Um, again, not to be confused with the mascara, which, given our love for Wonder Woman, might be confusing. But sit back, relax, and enjoy. So very little, as I said before, is known of her other than the nine volumes of her work, which were widely read in Antiquita. Only fragments really survived. There are mixed reports on her works as if they were destroyed by people who were uncomfortable with her writing or if they were plagiarized. My understanding, many were aware that once there had existed a highly praised female poet from the works of others, and they preserved those poems. Some kind of written works were composed concerning her during her lifetime or shortly after because the outline of her life was known by later writers and aside from inscriptions. She is one of the first songwriters that we know of or at least one of the first people that wrote songs down because everything that they found of hers that you know would showcase it was a song are some of the earliest we've seen. She is also one of the first people to refer to the moon as silver. So in many songs, in many writings, in many plays, you hear um, by the light of the silvery moon or it is a much more common term today, and, and she's another one that historians found to be one of the first people to really make that, uh, make that reference. One of the great Greek lyricists and few known female poets of ancient world is Sappho. She was born sometime between 630 and 612 BC. She was said to be small and dark in appearance, 
And again, we don't, we don't see much. We only see this referenced once in some of the research I did. Her wealth afforded her with the opportunity to live her life as she chose. And she chose to spend it studying the arts on the Isle of Lesbos. Apparently, her birthplace, though, was either Eros or Mithlene, the main city on the island, where she seems to have lived for some time. Even the names of her family members are inconsistent, but she does seem to have several brothers and to have married and had a daughter named Cleese. One of the accounts say her husband was named, and this is one of the, in, you'll get these references in the blog, but her husband's name translates into the big prick. And I thought that was really funny. All of this is speculation, but that was one of my favorites. Scholars have discussed her likely political connections to have proposed plausible biogeographical details, but these remain highly speculative. Of the female poets of antiquity, Sapo is best known for her ideas to bring in girls to the island of Lesbos and really teach them how to write, teach them about poetry and influence and command the attention of letting people know what life was like as a woman living in these centuries. In the 7th century BC, Lesbos was a cultural center. Sapo spent most of her time on the island though she also traveled widely throughout Greece. During these periods, women played a part in the domestic sphere, but were not as accepted as writers or encouraged to try other professions deemed to be quote-unquote man's work. The topics in her poem were highly controversial, as she often wrote about female lovers or wrote about longing for other women. Besides writing of desire... She wrote many poems about the close relationships that women would have with each other. Aphrodite was another central topic in uh, Sappho's poems. The poems not only reveal characteristics of goddesses, but also what strong connections both women and men felt for this uh, mythological figure. Even though Sappho was sent away from Lesbos because of her aristocratic connections, she was eventually allowed to return. She was exiled for a time around 600 BC. Again, the timelines that I found were completely inconsistent (laughs) from birth to exile to her being in Sicily, but that's most of what I read. So she did spend some time in Sicily. So Layla... Now, we just went to the Taylor Swift concert, correct? Yeah. And as you know now, Sapo was one of the first songwriters um, that's ever been found in history. Do you think Taylor Swift writes her own songs? Sometimes. Yep, she does. She's actually also a songwriter just like Sapo. So I want you to, to think about Sapo was widely known across you know the world as they knew it at that time she was so popular and she was popular for about a thousand years right wow she she wasn't even live for for like over half of it probably she was pretty much the taylor swift of her time but her time lasted for a thousand years do you think have you ever heard of sapo as a singer no no. Um, do you think Taylor Swift songs will last a thousand years? Maybe. They might, right? What's your favorite Taylor Swift song? Okay, just stop it now. <laughs> you don't have... Mine is, um, Look What You Made Me Do. Shake it off, I don't care. <laughs> In antiquity, Sapo was regularly counted among the greatest of poets and was often referred to as the poetess, just as Homer was called the poet. Plato hailed her as the tenth muse, 
and she was honored on coins with civic statuary. One poem that contains elements of passion, desire, ideology, and mythology appears in Walter Peterson's translations of Sappho's poem titled To Aphrodite. The poem idolizes Aphrodite and implores her help for guidance. In the last section of the poem, she writes, And now again come to me, cares dispelling, my soul's temptest, fiery passion quelling, my heart's desire for me fulfill, and be my friend and ally still. Sappho seems to be imploring the help of Aphrodite as a friend, but there are also hints that she, like most men in the time period, recognized the significance of Aphrodite's famous irresistibility. Men were not only the ones who desired the accompaniment of this goddess, in writing about her deep love for women, you could feel another in a society that kept the sexes apart. Sappho took extreme risks as a woman writing in a male-dominated world. Like other female poets, Sappho's work survives in fragments. Sappho produced one of only a few recordings of female work in Greece that still exists today. Along with her poetic contributions, she had enormous significance in the advancement of Greek women. As a teacher, Sappho was a mistress of her own school in Lesbos for Women. And her love poems were compositions specifically written for presentations to a female audience. Gender not only played a role in Sappho's poems, but also held a function in all her writings. In restored pieces of art from Greece, there are portraits and sculptures of women in powerful positions. We can only imagine that Greek society allowed women to write as in depicted in pictures in one of Thomas's Hague's uh, novel about antiquity. There are also drawings of women weaving and spinning and even hunting for boars. It is difficult putting all of these elements together as literature depicts women one way, poetry another, and art nothing uh, short of the high life. She was a prolific writer, and her work was collected in the nine volumes uh, around the third century BC. This is something that we referenced earlier in the podcast as well. Unfortunately, her work was deemed obscene by the church, and most of it was burned. (laughs) Most of them were lost, and Sappho was known only through quotations and other ancient writers until the 1900s, when considerable fragments of her work began to be found on papyrus in Egypt. And so only a few hundred lines of her poetry remain. In her lifetime, she invented a 12-string lyre, which she used to accompany herself when she sang her poems. She also founded a society of women bound to religious and secular oaths. Her stance, which consists of three long lines and one short one, was uh, greatly emulated by later poets such as Horace and Callus. Really, apart from her fascination with the theme of love, Sappho contributed in other ways to the conversation of the lyric genre. Her emphasis on emotion, on subjective experience, and on the individual marks a stark contrast between her work and the epic or dramatic poetry of that period. Much earlier poetry, it was in various ways empathetic to the public, but much of her work is is intimate and, and really private. They address specific women or her friends and her tone of her colloquial familiarity anticipates medieval and modern practice just as the names of her friends and enemies 
that, you know, Taylor Swift uses in her songs. So there is a little bit of similarity, at least when I did my research on Sapo and kind of some of where we're at um, from a, a musical dichotomy today. Sapo's texts assume an immediate net of circumstances and imply that only through the particular can the universal be manifested, unlike some of the earlier singers, even earlier than Sapo, who had memorized the values and ideology of whose social group while remaining themselves in anonymity, the lyricist uh, Sappho, prominent among them, found the truest and most um, significant material in individual experience. So, and in, in what I'm trying to say here is, like, Layla, my daughter, as some of you may know or may not know, uh, Derek and the Dominoes sang a song called Layla, and that was not, that was about individual experience, but it was also based on the tale of Layla and Manju. So Eric Clapton at the time was in love with George Harrison's wife. So when he wrote the song, it was a bit of a metaphor and also an indirect love note to Patty Boyd. Now, in Sapo's belief in the way she wrote her music was more indirect. So you knew it was her and you knew who it was about. So in, in different contexts, we do see that in music today, but we do see a lot more of that indirect conversation. Now... At this time, major male writers expressed different views regarding women that make it difficult to examine how they were generally treated. The writings are, of course, open to interpretation, but in reading between the lines, most place women below men. The works of Plato and Aristotle have contributed to a vast amount of information and subject matter to discuss among political theorists and historians. The fact that Plato was bold enough to express the opinion, quote, if women are expected to do the same work as men, we must teach them the same things, end quote, proves that despite the split between male and female expectations, there were individuals with an alternative vision. In Synopsis, Plato supported the idea that Athenian men were neglectful to their women, like Plato, other male writers were bold to write about women, and some didn't. Some abandoned the female half of humanity and just wrote about men. There are novels, essays, poems, and quotations that reveal the rebellion from traditional roles, but detailed information regarding how those rebellions were met are scarce. Plato's writing often contained elements of proto-feminism, while Aristotle's writing are criticized for being plainly misogynistic. In fact, Aristotle and Sappho have one thing in common. They directed their work to a gender-specific audience. They also wrote and spent the majority of time with members of the same sex. The male poets living in the period were parts of traditional circles that Holt Parker describes as being, quote, tied by family, class, politics, and erotic love, end quote. Sappho paved the way for other female writers, but the circles of women were never fully embraced by archaic society. It was Holt's belief that, quote, a wife performs few, if any, functions in the household beyond producing children, end quote. Whereas Homer's opinion was that, quote, a woman was meant not only to produce and raise heirs, but also to preside over her household by viewing and watching over the domestic slaves and goods, end quote. These opinions are not so different. They both tried to define the worth of, of the female in connection to the home. Homer's opinion gives new light to the characters in the Odyssey. Although it seemed as though it had a deep respect for mortal women, while the quotation diminishes that idea, scholars and students are undoubtedly familiar with this epic poem and its distinct portrayal of female characters. Homer's characters are singular, 
but the Odyssey encounters with women are complicated. When he is tempted to sleep with other women, he remains faithful. Homer's depiction of Athena is unusual for that time period. He wrote, quote, Then she caught up a powerful spear, edged with sharp bronze, heavy, huge, thick, wherewith she beats down the battalions of fighting men, end quote. Athena is described as a warrior fighting equally the battles of men, even though women could not be soldiers in reality. In this case, myth is far from reality. Also, many widely interpreted issues emerge regarding Penelope's role in this story. Although she remains a faithful wife, she shows true strength when she cleverly tricks the suitors telling them she cannot remarry until she weaves a shroud for her father-in-law. Her plan strengthens the character and indicates that female intellect wins over male desires. It seems strange that Homer would include so many heroines and still believe that a woman was supposed to be confined to the home. Perhaps he was torn between what was accepted and really his own feelings. Now, Sappho was, she was called a lyricist because, as was the custom of the time, she wrote her poems to be performed with the accompany of a lyre. Sappho composed her own music and refined the prevailing lyric meter to a point that is known as a sapphic meter. She involved lyric poetry both in technique and style becoming part of a new wave of Greek lyricists who moved from writing poetry from the point of view of gods and muses to a personal vantage point of the individual. She was one of the first poets to write from the first person, describing love and loss as it affected her personally. In terms of ideas, this stance meant that while much early literature had been sustained, by social conscious of collected vision expressed in myth and legend, Sappho was free to be critical, to point out gaps and problems in the received opinions of her society. She challenges the heroic ethos that buttresses uh, patriotism, I mean, most strikingly in poem 36, and throughout her work, she asserts in a way little known in archaic and traditional societies. This potentially submersive privacy of the individual consciousness and the validity of its opinions and impulses. This does not, of course, mean that her poetic practice was wholly modern. Her work, though perhaps composed in writing, was meant to be performed orally, as can be seen from poems uh, 118, 160, and others, Many of her texts suggest that she adhered consciously or not to the view that poetry was a form of magic and that by manipulating language, one could also manipulate the reality that it described. Her poems of praise and blame contributed to the development of the most distinct literary of rhetorical types. But even those poems have not wholly lost the original sense of language in the sympathetic magic, though the sense is sliding toward wish fulfillment in poems such as number two or 17. It really is her just continuing to take her language and turning it into song or turning it into music. And it's something that carried through her time and why she was so popular and it was learning really about hooks and about singing and about bringing people together. But I think more importantly, it was about the different point of view that she brought. In literary history and critical theory, Sappho's greatest importance is to be found in her contribution to the idea of the lyric genre. Her work, which claimed to be direct, impassioned, and simple, which is addressed to a circle of close friends and lovers rather than being impersonal or directed to be more generalized, has significantly influenced the evolution of poetry. Her celebration of love has re-echoed through the centuries, not only in the work of translators and direct imitators, but also in all of those other voices 
that have dared declare their love to be radically important, most compelling and serious than abstract notions of truth or justice. At the same time, Sappho reminds modern readers of poetry roots in magic and in religion, while occupying a firm place in Greece literary history as a metaphorical inventor and an expert practitioner of her art. So it comes from, you know, at the time that she was at, it came from when men's point of views were coming through in some kind of lyrical form. It could be for religion. As we all know, rhyming and music can also be a learning tool in helping us memorize certain ideologies, whereas she was using it much more as a form of expression and a form of love and loss. So it's something that definitely broke you know, the standard tradition of how the males were viewing the ways of Greek poetry. Now, Layla, you take piano, correct? Yeah, but not this summer. Not that, nope, you didn't take it this summer. Do you think you'll ever write a song or play it on the piano? No. No, not at all. I I don't think so, maybe, though. If you did write a song, what do you think it would be about today? Moo. Moo? Mula? No. Money? No, not me. <laughs> it would be about you? Yeah. I wait. love it. I would listen to a song about you every day, all day, all the time. Okay. <laughs> Charles Seltman's Women in Antiquity was the first written in the 1950s and later reproduced, but it was an interesting time for the novel to emerge, having many similarities in societal structures as that of archaic Greece. Although it sounds far-fetched, the domestic role of women was essential to both societies. Seltman describes it as being a favorable period for women, but that perspective could have been completely different coming from a writer in, say, the 1960s. There have been a wide range of analytical perspectives through the years, depending on the expectations of style of the time period. The book is unique because it specifically describes and compares life in multiple societies. The daily life and customs of women in the heroic age deeply affects city-states such as Sparta, Iona, and Athens. Of the three, Athens and Sparta are most commonly known and referred to in historical literature. The historical and cultural elements of Sparta and Athenia societies provide a realistic representation of ancient Greece, separate from that which has been provided by literature and myth. The beauty and sexual qualities of female mythological figures made it hard for women, along with the depiction of faithful and subservient wives and maidens. Fortunately, there seems to be a balance among the submissive and dominating female figures, All of the sources that provide scholars with information are unique in form and content, making it a difficult process to analyze the role of women in ancient Greece. It isn't possible to form a conclusive statement because the topic will continue to be discussed and it still continues to be rediscovered. Greece will always be a subject of fascination and the role of women as it flourishes and changes over time will also demand historical information from the period. During antiquity, women faced many problems that are distinct from the problems women face today, but they also faced many of the same challenges. Today, women are still forced to conform to stereotypes that society creates, but at least they have the opportunity to write about their experiences. Sappho's style was sensual and methodic, primarily songs of love, yearning, and reflection. Most commonly, the target of her affection was female, often one of the many women sent to her for education in the arts. She nurtured these women, wrote poems of love and admiration to them, and when they eventually left the island to be married, she composed their wedding songs. 
Sappho's poetry was not condemned in her time, really because in that time, sexuality wasn't as defined as brash as it is today. There wasn't a label of who you could love. You just simply loved. So as time went on and people read her stuff, there was a stricter movement through Christianity and other things to destroy this work and to put those labels on who you can love and who you can't love. So you have to be mindful when reading some of this is that in Greece and in some of those ancient times, it isn't as brash as it is today. Especially in uh, the last century, Sappho has become so synonymous with women love that two of the most popular words to describe female homosexuality have derived from her, uh, hence the island of Lesbos and such. From ancient time to today, Sappho has remained an important literary and cultural figure. Her works continue to be studied and translated. New poets are inspired by her constantly, and speculation on her life remains popular in the form of fictionalized tales and uh, research. For a woman who has been dead for over 2,000 years, this is quite an achievement. Layla, what do you think? What is your favorite part of this story? My favorite part is probably that she was, her songs were popular for over a thousand years. That That's was cool to and, me. And that people still want to learn about her and such. Yeah, but then how come she wasn't in history books? Right. You're not going to find her in, in many history books. But there are a lot of people that are writing about her today, and I will provide all of that for you like, like in the blog you're wa- You wrote about it in, on your computer, like that. Well, right. right. I'm talking about her today to try to get people to learn a little more about her and understand that the Madonnas, the Janet Jacksons, the Nicki wait, Minajs. Wait, wait, maybe Madonna songs are going to last. That would be nice. I do like Madonna. But like uh, all of these female writers have some attribution that comes from Sappho's and in, in the way Wait. that she writes. And there's a lot of male writers that could attribute what to her if, too. What if Josh makes songs and they last a thousand years? Every one of Josh's songs last a thousand years. That's a nod to our producer. That's right. Yeah. Well, thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Do you want to remind us, Layla, who sponsored this episode? Me. Can you tell us more about where they can find you? Etsy. Peppermint Bay by Layla. Search <laughs> that up. Whatever. I don't know. Thank you for your sponsorship, Layla. And as always, thank you for coming to co-host. We look forward to talking to everyone again on October 15th, 2018.